For the remainder of your lectures before your next quizam, we are going to be talking about light and telescopes. Light is the astronomer's tool. Without it, we wouldn't really be able to do astronomy. And we certainly wouldn't have been as far along as we are uh, in, in our understanding of the universe. So due to the vast distances of things in our universe, which you've already learned about, direct measurements of astronomical bodies are not possible except for a few things within our own solar system. We can study bodies, remote bodies, by analyzing their light, by analyzing the light that comes to us from them. And understanding the properties of light is important. If we're going to use light to help inform us about the universe, we have to understand what light is first. Here's a really beautiful picture of uh, a supernova called Supernova 1987A. And it has this cool sort of ring feature and it looks a little bit like an hourglass. These double rings here are sort of like the edges of an hourglass. Here are a couple of important properties of light. Light does not require a medium for travel. You do not have to have material for light to move through. Light can travel through a vacuum. That's different from sound. Sound travels by compressing and, and compressing air. And then that compressed air um, makes um, compressions in our eardrums and that's what we hear for sound. A light doesn't need a material to move through. It can move through a vacuum. It can move through empty space. Light travels at a special speed. Here it's listed in kilometers per second as um, 300,000, almost 300,000 kilometers per second. That's fast enough to circle our Earth 7.5 times in one second. That's pretty fast. The speed of light in the vacuum is a constant and we denote it by this letter C, lowercase letter C. So if you see a letter C, a lowercase letter C, that represents the speed of light. And so for our purposes, we're gonna say that the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second. We've already encountered this too. And here's a cool picture that I like. It's called the mice galaxies. It's two galaxies that got a little bit too close to each other and they sort of ripped each other apart as they were moving past each other. Um, but we wouldn't be able to see these beautiful things without light. Sometimes light can be described as a wave. This wave travels as a result of a fundamental relationship between electricity and magnetism. This important relationship is that a changing magnetic field creates an electric field and a changing electric field creates a magnetic field. So you have these fluctuating electric and magnetic fields and that fundamental relationship between these fluctuating electric and magnetic fields is what provides us with light. It provides us with, with what we call the electromagnetic spectrum because we've got changing magnetic fields, changing, in electric, changing electric fields, provide us with the electromagnetic spectrum of which light is the electromagnetic spectrum. So here we have our fluctuating electric field in red and perpendicular to that we have our fluctuating magnetic field. So that light, that fluctuating electric and magnetic field travels like a wave you see here, kind of like a sine curve or a cosine curve. That light, in this case, is leaving the sun and coming to Earth. Here's an example of what I mean when I'm talking about a wave. So if you recently had your math classes where you've talked about sine and cosine waves, um, these, this, this is an example of a wave that we're talking about when we talk about light. It looks like that same shape. And um, something I'm gonna talk about a lot that relates to light in its wave form is the wavelength. So if here we have our wave of light, the wavelength is the distance between either consecutive crests in that wave or consecutive troughs in the wave. So you can describe light by talking about its wavelength. 
That's the distance between consecutive peaks or troughs along the wave. But sometimes light can be described as a particle. This is what we call the wave particle duality of light. Light can also be thought of as a stream of particles called photons. Photons are individual packets of light. Each photon particle contains energy depending on the frequency of the wavelength. So what's the frequency? The frequency is the number of times a wave crest passes a given point in one second. For the units of frequency, we use a unit that is essentially one over second, or we call it Hertz, H-E-R-T-Z, or we abbreviate it as capital H, lower Z. The wavelength we talk about in units of distance, so meters, or sometimes we use nanometers. One nanometer is 10 to the minus nine meters. So we're thinking again about our light, as a wave, the wavelength of light is equal to the speed of light divided by the frequency. You could rearrange this equation and solve for the frequency, and then you would find that the frequency is equal to the speed of light divided by the wavelength. So if I ask you to calculate the wavelength of light and you know its frequency, then you can use this equation. The wavelength is equal to the speed of light, that's our three times 10 to the eight meters per second, divided by its frequency. Or if I ask you to find the frequency of light and you know its wavelength, you can take the speed of light and divide it by the wavelength in meters in order to find the frequency in units of hertz, inverse seconds. So which model do we choose? Do we choose the wave model of light or the particle model of light? It all depends on the situation. Um, in a vacuum, photons travel in straight lines, but they also behave like waves. Subatomic particles can also act like waves. So this wave particle duality, all particles of nature can behave as both a wave and a particle that even includes things like electrons, these fundamental particles, things that we're made up of. So which property of light we use depends on the situation. We tend to concentrate on the light as a wave paradigm in this astronomy class. So I'm mostly gonna be talking about light when we think about it as a wave. So the colors to which the human eye is sensitive is referred to as the visible spectrum of light. In, wave theory, in our wave theory of light, color is determined by the light's wavelength. And we symbolize the wavelength. I didn't really point this out in the previous slide, but we symbolize the wavelength as this Greek, lowercase Greek letter lambda. That's what this little symbol means. And when I use that symbol, that refers to the wavelength of our light. So our nanometer, one nanometer, 10 to the minus nine meters, is the convenient unit, unit we often use for wavelength, okay? So the color red has a wavelength of 700 nanometers. That's the longest wavelength of light that's visible for most humans, their eyes. And then violet has a wavelength of 400 nanometers, that's the shortest wavelength visible to most human eyes. But anything that falls within there from red at the longest visible wavelength to violet, which is the shortest visible wavelength, anything between there we refer to as the electromagnetic spectrum. And those are all the colors that we can see in the rainbow. So here is a chart of our electromagnetic spectrum. And I took this from your textbook. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about the electromagnetic spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum, that's all the possible wavelengths of light that exist in our universe. Our human eyes can only see the small range that we call the visible light spectrum. And again, that small range spans from about purple of about 400 nanometers all the way up to red of about 700 nanometers. Waves of light with longer wavelengths than red 
we refer to those as infrared. And then you can get to even longer wavelengths of light. Those become microwaves, same way that your microwave that heats up your food works. And then we get to the longest wavelength waves and we call those radio waves. And those are the waves of the electromagnetic spectrum on which information is traveling, um, you know, if you're listening to the AM or FM radio. Then if we go to the other end of the spectrum, um, shorter wavelengths of light, light shorter than um, 400 nanometers, we have ultraviolet light. That's the UV light that can damage your skin. And then uh, X-rays, even shorter, those are the same X-rays of light that uh, are used to take you know, X-rays of your body to look at your bones. And then the, the, the shortest wavelength light is called gamma rays. Now, all of these wavelengths of light also have an energy associated with them. So as you get to longer and longer and longer wavelengths, the energy associated with that light decreases. As you get to shorter and shorter and shorter wavelengths, the energy associated with that light is bigger. Okay, so if you have a very long wavelength of light in the radio wave part of the spectrum, it's going to have a lower energy than uh, a very, very short wavelength of light way over here in the gamma ray part of our spectrum. That wavelength of light is going to have a high amount of energy. And that photon, that individual packet of light, is also carrying this energy. And that wavelength of light is carrying that energy. Up here in this top level, We've got um, stars like our sun and the other stars in our universe and our Milky Way galaxy too. Those stars are emitting light in um, the visible, but they're also emitting light in ultraviolet and infrared as well. Uh, things that are a little bit colder, like the interstellar material, material between galaxies, um, that material is a little bit colder and so it has longer wavelengths. And as you get to longer and longer wavelengths, those things tend to uh, have less energy and they tend to have um, a cooler temperature. Objects that emit light that has a shorter wavelength, that light has more energy. Um, those are gonna be the most volatile processes that we're gonna see in our universe. I'm gonna ask you, what is your favorite color? If you don't have one, you get to pick one. And what is the wavelength of that color? So you can look off of your um, electromagnetic spectrum chart to figure out what the wavelength is of that color in nanometers. And remember, one nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 meters. And then you're going to tell me what is that color's frequency. Remember, we talked about how you can calculate frequency. To calculate the frequency of that light, you are going to take the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, and you divide it by the wavelength of light in meters. Okay, so we said that the wavelength of light is equal to the speed of light divided by the frequency. So if I wanna solve for the frequency of light, I would say that the frequency of light is equal to the speed of light divided by its wavelength, okay? So the speed of light is three times 10 to the eight meters per second, okay? I divide that by the wavelength of light. So you choose your um, wavelength of light, and I'm going to choose something that is not even <laughs> in the part of the visible spectrum, just to um, show you what to do. So let's say I'm choosing a wavelength of light that actually humans can't see, but anyway, if I want to find the frequency of a wavelength of light that's 100 nanometers, 100 nanometers is 100 times 10 to the minus nine meters. Times 10 to the minus nine, that's a nanometer. So if something's 100 nanometers, you can write it as 100 times 10 to the minus nine meters equals. So I'm gonna use my calculator to figure out what this is. So three times 10 to the eight divided by 100 times 10 to the minus nine meters. Okay, so that gives me a frequency of three times 10 to the 15 hertz. Hertz is our unit of frequency, okay? So that is how you're going to do the calculation in order to figure out 
um, what is the frequency of the wavelength of light for your favorite color?